Tell me if this sounds familiar. It's the beginning of your watch obsession, and you get curious about vintage watches. You hit the search engines, and you find all the old threads on the forums and articles on blogs. You read as much as you can about brands, models, reference numbers. You start combing through eBay and Craigslist for weeks, maybe even months, and you discover that there is a ton out there. And then suddenly you realize you don't even know what you want, do you? I've been there. Watch collecting is driven by passion and appreciation for the history, the stories, and the metal. It all points to why we love vintage watches, and there are a lot out there. But I think there's one that serves as a perfect entry point into the world of vintage watches. On this installment of A Week on the Wrists, I'm going to explore why the Universal Genève Pole Router is the best way to get into vintage watches. The Pole Router is emblematic of mid-century watch design, and wearing it can take you back to that glorious era. The 50s were characterized by the post-war economic boom that gave rise to suburban life, a flourishing economy, and an explosion of pop culture on the ground. And in the air, the jet age was just beginning, with the possibility to go places people had only dreamed of going before. This watch is just one of an entire family of pole router models. The earliest iterations were called Pola router, and later was adjusted to simply pole router. On November 15, 1954, SAS, an acronym for Scandinavian Airline Systems, opened up a new commercial route that went from Los Angeles to Copenhagen, operating a Douglas DC-6B. It took 22 hours as opposed to the previous 36. Flying used to be an occasion, and you would need an elegant but sporty watch for the job. The pole router is just that. The watch was designed to be anti-magnetic, and it was launched with a bumper movement, the Caliber 138SS, before moving to a micro-rotor movement, starting with the Caliber 215, and then the Caliber 218, the Caliber 69, and the Caliber 72. That's a whole lot of calibers, but what about the watches they went in? I was curious to know, how many executions of the Pole Rider are there? So I asked an expert. So you've created the reference on the pole router, universalgenetpolerouter.com. What is it and how did it come to be? The idea of the site is to basically collate all of the information uh, possible for polar router lineups and help collectors decide on potential uh, purchases and assess or assess pieces that they already have uh, so they can make a decision if, if they want to buy a piece or trade a piece or whatever. Or, have a go at restoring the piece themselves and look for the right parts. More experienced collectors do tend to forget how difficult it can be when you're, when you're new, uh, starting out collecting, how difficult it can be to evaluate a vintage piece. Uh, so it's easy, easy mistakes to make. So I end, ended up on a bit of a mission to figure out what these numbers were between the lugs and what it meant. So I started basically making big spreadsheets of dial characteristics and watch characteristics and, and, and how it related to all these numbers. Um, and it snowballed from there, uh, really. How many references of the pole router would you say there are? How many executions of the watch? I mean, when we're filling in the numbers, it probably looks like somewhere over a thousand, somewhere in the order of a thousand or maybe more. Um, so a lot. <laughs> wow. And, and Kai, how did you come to that number? How did you come to the conclusion that there are over a thousand? Filling in the gaps, we have these, uh, for instance, 2017-1, and then there's a dash two, um, and sometimes we can see, okay, then the next one we found is a dash six. So there's probably going to be a dash three, a dash four, and a dash five somewhere. We just haven't found them yet. So that's the way it sort of extrapolates into, into over a thousand different references. Fantastic. You're doing God's work, Adam. Thanks. Just look at this watch. It's stunning. The story goes that in conjunction with the launch of the SAS Polar Route, Universal Genève recruited a young Gerald Genta to design a watch. He was only 23 at the time, making it one of his earliest designs. Some design cues, like liar lugs, the proportions of the dial, and the radial grooving on the chapter ring 
solidified the specific design language of this very watch, and also became signature Genta, well before he designed some of his more widely known watches, like the Royal Oak and the Nautilus. The case measures roughly 35 millimeters, which is typical of the era, and it's 11 millimeters tall, lending a sporty feeling on the wrist. Sure, it's smaller than the standard sizing of today, but that's exactly what makes it great. Wearing it takes you back in time. The pole router is tied to aviation, but it doesn't have any of the usual hallmarks of a pilot's watch. No GMT hand, no chronograph. Instead, it has a sense of elegance that's typical of mid-century design. It wears like the most classic variety of a gentleman's watch. It's small, light, and simple. It's also the kind of watch that gives you plenty of latitude with straps. There really aren't that many vintage watches out there that hit that sweet spot between affordability, a genuinely interesting origin story, and a classic and balanced aesthetic. And the best part? They're out there. Plenty of these watches were made.